I am honored to discuss the English embroideries from Anita and Urban Schwartz's collection. To honor their memory, I have to talk about the embroideries with a mix of love of their special details, as well as the importance of many of them in scholarly pursuits. Anita's love of her embroideries went far beyond their decorative appeal. They went straight to the core of the human condition, to hope and love as epitomized by this picture of Cupid, Venus, and Adonis, and yet, as much as she loved them, she had both a scholar's eye and that of a maker when choosing. It was back in 2009 that I met this extraordinary couple. I was in the area, visiting the Herdigs, while delivering the reproduction 1620s Plymouth jacket to Wintertour. Over a glass of wine, I was musing about insights from this project, and John asked me, what does Anita think about a particular point? My quizzical look was all that was needed, and a call was made. It was settled. Anita and Irvin invited us to Hidden Glen Farms the next morning. I would bring the coif and forehead cloth from the project to show them. Well, a visit to their home was pure magic. Immediately, I recognized in Anita a kindred soul. Her energy was boundless, and I had trouble keeping up with her as she led us with a small flashlight, pointing out a myriad of details and trying to compress decades of research into small lectures about every piece. As we stood in front of this piece, I immediately realized the depth of her understanding of this period of embroidery. Small and gray at first glance, with the subject matter not immediately apparent, I knew that Anita had chosen it with the recognition of the tremendous technological achievement of the embroiderer. Worked almost entirely in different techniques and silver thread, the quality of the workmanship was phenomenal. I was in the middle, midst of compiling an encyclopedia of metal thread stitches of this period, and I recognized not only the difficulty of the stitches, but the extreme skill they were executed in. Later, when she showed me cushions she was working with wool that she had taught her sons to spin, I understood that her scholarship went deep. Anita was not content with traditional scholarship, but had to get into the minds of the makers. That is evident everywhere in her choices of 17th century embroideries and what I would like to share with you today. In my extensive survey of stump work embroidery, I have been recording the dimensions of storyline, draftsperson, materials, and technique, looking for groupings. This piece of a marital couple with harmony, allegorical of Anita and Irvin themselves, is of a particular, particularly interesting grouping that has formed from pieces in the Met, Burl, and Feller collections. They all share an extreme and raised work, both highly technical and sometimes raised as much as three quarters off the surface. Studded with semi-precious stones, the pieces can take hours to explore. At this point, it is hard to tell if this was the output of a supremely skilled student, of a highly selective teacher, or of an unusually expensive professional workshop. Although it is certain that they were worked under a singular visionary because the details of each are indistinguishable from each other in technique, materials, and execution. This beadwork basket from their collection is another example of a grouping made by Mary Blumfeld in 1659. The image of the Harmony betrothal couple is shared by a basket made by what we may now assume was her classmate, Sarah Gurnall, also of 1659. They are so similar that you can even cut a part of Sarah's and overlay it on Mary's, showing that it was a pre-drawn pattern on the linen, linen that they both had. Differences are minor in the choice of colored beads and the placement of letters in the blank spaces. Sarah's gives more information with a full date of August 20th. Sarah's piece, now at the V&A, was worked on a similar frame as Mary's, but she chose to fill in the exterior sides with a net instead of the curly handles Mary used for hers, which required wrapping all the iron frame with beads. This technique used by Mary shows on a series of five small green and white baskets, some found in caskets, that may have been an introductory school project as the basic techniques required to make your larger piece are taught in them. These embroideries were chosen by someone who was intrigued by small details and technical quality as well as what the object had to teach. Therefore, I'm going to focus about the, the almost the rest of my talk on many of the caskets because the catalog does not have the room to show what Anita found interesting about each. During my visit to Hidden Glen Farms, we only had time to look inside one cabinet, and Anita chose this one, very special because Irvin had wrangled it away from its owner as a birthday present for her. Anita had long loved this piece, and immediately I could see that it presented an enormous issue for those of us who are working to categorize them. Its form was both recognizable and yet not traditional. While the allegory of the five senses on the sides and Adam and Eve on the top is within the tradition, 
the drafting of the figures under the arches and choice of motifs around the frieze are anything but, and the techniques used fall outside of the schoolgirl stump work that we are used to seeing. It is when the cabinet was opened that a useful clue for identification appears in the stunningly embroidered drawer fronts. The arms are that of the Stansfield and Evelyn families conjoined, and though Ananita thought that the piece was made to commemorate the marriage of Eleanor Stansfield and Richard Evelyn, which took place about 1613, and would make this a highly unusual and early casket. Even more so when you know that they were the parents of the famous diarist John Evelyn. So was this piece made by Eleanor, or was it commissioned near the marriage or later? I think the embroidery can tell us more by examining it. Details that I know Anita delighted in and why this piece was so special to her. Looking at the top, the animals are worked in couch silver over padding with black glass bead eyes. And if you look closely, you will see delicately, delicately worked silk, silk thread mates for each of these animals. They came two by two. Then we can explore the arcaded frames that support grass, trees, and small villages. The techniques on this require a complex metal wrapped loose silk thread that is then purled. The trees are always worked as a series of vertical clumps on a trunk. This is a recognizable style and materials of a particular professional embroidery house as of yet unnamed out of the few dozen masters in Antwerp in the first quarter of the 17th century. Flemish caskets were exported to France, England, and Spain in the first half of the 17th century until about 1670. Ria Fabri's book on Antwerp cabinets of the 17th century details the extent of the trade in cabinets for the middle class around northern Europe. Antwerp cabinets were very popular export items and were, were requested by merchants in the network for sale to their clients. Ralph Hampson of London wrote in a letter on April 12, 1652, Send me four or five cabinets, three with pitchers and a perspective, and two with tortoise shell on the inside. The sheer number of them being produced made them more like a factory item than an art object. An ebony cabinet maker had about three to four weeks to produce a cabinet and the painters or embroiderers about two weeks to produce all the panels. Contornex tot broderwerk, or cabinets with embroidery, are mentioned in the Antwerp trade from as early as 1621. The craze for them seems to have died down by about 1665 when their mention in documents fades away. This is coincidentally when the making of schoolgirl embroidered cabinets in England takes off. Their similarity to the English embroidered cabinets can be seen in the embroidered sides, doors, and drawer structures, as well as shapes. Some English embroidered cabinets, such as this at the Holborn Museum, have a small mirrored perspective that match the cabinets exactly. Trays lined with five cristallo mirrors with an open end are commonly found in English schoolgirl embroidered caskets. I have heard numerous explanations for them, such as putting on makeup or magnifying the light of a candle, but I believe that these are imitations of the mirrored perspectives from the Antwerp cabinets. Most English trays have prints that lie on the bottom of the tray. In some cases, a small statue of a bird or figure is in the center, repeated in the mirrors, and some have small gilded architectural columns in the corners, replicating what is seen in the Antwerp perspectives. My hypothesis is that the smaller version on feet was used as the model by a set of English merchants for a uniquely English schoolgirl version. The painted and etched silver plate Flemish version, versions contain the same figural stories as the ones on English embroideries. The embroideries that feature on the cabinets have detailed silk flowers, arcades worked in metal threads in the same complex grassy work above as on Anita's cabinet. Under the arches are animals and sea creatures worked in silver thread over padding, seen better in this glove worked by the same workshop. We can even compare the technique of the sea creatures to the fish on Adam and Eve scene. It may be conjecture at this point, but I think there is a strong possibility that the casket or embroidery had a low country's origin and was commissioned for the Evelyn family. Possibly, through the same network working with the Flemish ebony cabinets. This casket and another in her collection also held a wonderful surprise. While the edges and drawers um, are often decorated with silver stampings on the papers, and sometimes the same were used to impress the inside of the doors, Anita chose two pieces where this embellishment was used to decorate all interior surfaces, including the sides and backs of the drawers. 
I had traveled to Sotheby's in December to take apart all of her caskets as I had a deep feeling, knowing her, that her pieces would hold hidden surprises and they did not disappoint. In this case, I have never seen this detailing in almost a hundred caskets I have opened, and here it was twice. I had to look up and share a smile with Anita. If I was ever to write a book about how embroidered caskets are made, most of the evidence can be found in, in Anita and Irvin's collection. The craze for schoolgirl-made embroidered cabinets originated after the Civil, English Civil War and was likely fed by a small group of draftsmen who designed the popular pictures, mirrors, and cabinets filled with allegorical, biblical, and royal figures. Recent research of mine has shown that as few as three draftsmen drew about 80% of the pieces and has attributed a specific style to the known London draftsman and workshop owner, John Nevelson. This mirror is consistent with his drafting hand. His figures closely parallel the popular heavy-lidded style for portraiture of the period, in contrast to the almost manga-like cartoon eyes of this frequently seen unknown draftsperson. For caskets, the draftsman would prepare ground fabrics with closely spaced drawings, leaving almost no space between the panels, allowing the piece to be worked on one slate frame, and then cut apart by the finisher and applied to the casket, which was made to fit. Often you will find pictures and collections that are finished panels, which have been cut from likely unfinished pieces. Somewhere out there are the frame panels from this piece at the Metropolitan. In Anita's collection, there, was, there were a back and a front of a casket. The friezes for each side are either above or below and worked in the same technique mix. Here you can see the two doors and the dividing line between them. When the panels were finished, they were sent to the finisher. Outside of the time frame of this lecture, all evidence in matching lock manufacturer, hardware, sizing marks on the bottom of included inkwells, bookbinding stamps, and other data gleaned from the modern reproduction of these caskets is now pointing to a concentration of finishers in the London region. This is also supported by Hannah Smith's letter in her casket, which states that she sent her work to London to be made up. One of my hypotheses is that we can learn a great deal by the other materials used to make up the boxes. While they are highly valued today, mainly due to their folk repeal, the materials of the boxes point to a low-cost manufacture, such as the use of purple paper, akin to the meat wrapping paper we use today, to wrap the sides of the drawers and the inclusion of penny prints inside. This fantastic beaded casket has a wealth of penny prints inside. Before I show them to you, I have to point out that the pattern was used by more than one worker as evidenced by this matching box sold by Brunk Auctions. For Anita's box, the design was cut down by as much as four inches in the width and depth as you can see when matching the top and sides between the two pieces. The inside delighted me, though with no less than five prints and pieces of others glued in place. I am fascinated by these penny prints and examine each one in detail. Consistently, the engraver of the print is usually cut off, but the seller or printer of the print is not, and very often his name is shifted to be easily read, sometimes cutting off important parts of the seam, such as people's heads. This careful placement of the seller's name makes me think that it was an early version of the trade card. The only names that come up are Robert Walton and John Overton. Perhaps they were prominent resellers of finishing services in addition to their lucrative trade in printing inexpensive imagery. In this case, we find Robert Walton's name on one edge, but then a confusing situation where the print of flowers seems to almost match this one, engraved by John Dunstall for A Book of Slips of Flowers after 1666 and printed by John Overton. Dunstall engraved many plates for Overton, and one such new edition book was advertised in 1673 by Overton as 500 new sorts of birds, beasts, fish, flies, worms, flowers, fruits, figures, histories, landscapes, ovals, neatly cut in copper, and neatly colored, for a gentlewoman's works, and he is doing more as fast as time will permit. But perhaps the story is more complicated here because the print is not an exact match, and in fact, many of the flowers that do match are mirrored images, which leads us to remember the grand scale of copying that was going on between Robert Walton and John Overton, re-engraving each other's works, removing pieces of engravings and buying old plates off of other printers and restyling them with new and more current models or individuals. These men were attuned businessmen doing whatever was possible and popular as expediently as possible. 
This is a casket with much to, re, uh, to teach, and I hope to be able to examine it again someday in my continuing research. So it was with great interest when I lifted the tray out of this casket to find another print to examine. Because of the inexpensive nature of the prints included, I had yet to conclusively identify any of the dozens I have documented. Hand-colored and varnished in place, this scene reminded me of the Dutch winter landscapes. As I returned to Boston on the train that day, I studied the details in the print and was amazed to see that it was a scene of a frozen harbor with people skating, using sleds to unload, unload the ships, and they were also playing games. Well, it was these games that thrilled me and led to the identification of the print as Winter, one in the series of the Four Seasons by the Dutch engraver Robert de Baudus, circa 1618. You see on the right-hand side, the people are curling. These are wooden discs with wood stick handles, and you can see the brooms used to melt the ice ahead of the sliding disc. The Scots and Dutch fight over who invented curling first, and it shows up in genre paintings of the period on both sides, this being one of the earliest versions, as is that of Lot 474, a painting in Irvin's collection, and I will leave it to you for your own scavenger hunt after the symposium to find it and see the curling match. Another unusual game is seen at the far left of this print. Two men with curled sticks are trying to pull a ball from the ice's edge before it goes into the water. Well, this is called Kolf. Kolf was a long game played in the streets, courtyards, and other open areas. During the Little Ice Age of the 16th and 17th centuries, it was also played on frozen canals, rivers, and lakes. Many historians have suggested that the tight relationship between Scotland and the Low Countries had this game permutating into the modern golf, golf, or at least it lent the name to it. While the stories on the outsides of the caskets are fascinating, this being Rebecca and Isaac, and they certainly hold high decorative appeal, these were schoolgirl projects for young ladies between about 12 and 15 years of age. This casket is particularly wonderful and is of a grouping of caskets with the embroidery worked on paper, taught by an unidentified teacher who had them work exactly the same woven silk panels for the friezes and drawers. It is these drawers that make a casket go from being interesting to desirable. Once you start removing them in front of any, and I mean absolutely any audience, everyone starts to suck in their breath when they realize that there is a secret drawer lurking behind. This is where it totally leaves the academic interest and becomes love. After opening this casket, I knew it did for Anita as well. For when the secret panels and drawers are opened, you are transported back to that place where these little girls were at. They were at that age where they were on the cusp of adulthood, aware of the present, and yet still believed in magic. When we pull out a secret drawer hiding behind what looked like an immovable panel, you remember back to when you were 12 and a feather or an unusual rock held stories of fairies or other magic for you. That was the type of thing you would have placed in your special spot to hide from others. So you can just imagine my scream in storage here a month ago to pull out this drawer and know that as soon as Anita saw this, the box had to be hers. A faceted bead, a small spool of thread, a marble, starfish, and a winning and losing piece of wishbone, and not from the same wish. It almost doesn't ma matter if it was the maker or some later owner who put these there. It was certainly a set of magic items for a child. That said, the marble is consistent with the period, and I had to laugh thinking of how we would authenticate the wishbones. It reminded me of a highly spirited discussion with Irvin over wine with Linda Eaton and the Herdigs, of how he could do DNA testing on the hair of a memorial ring he wanted to purchase to validate if it was Washington's or not. That summed up this couple in my mind. Intense intellectual curiosity and scholarship, combined with an equally intense love of history in America, which had given them so much. As I looked at these pieces of wishbone, I am sure that carbon-14 dating of them crossed their minds. But then again, it was irrelevant, as Anita totally understood the meaning of these items in the secret drawer, pure childlike wonder and magic, and so she loved it, and I suspect many of us now do too. Thank you.